Andrew, our big get from last week, Jessica Reef Ehrlich, created a little bit of buzz around her appearance. And this week's big get, Mike Tirico, one year from the start of the Summer Olympics. And John, we'll talk Messi! Messi! And we're back, the Marshan Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. And he's John Oran, the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. And our big get, Mike Tarico, will have that in about 20 minutes or so. Uh, but first, John, let's just start off. Who's up and who's down? Who's up? Who's down? Andrew, get us started. My who's up is Lionel Messi. The reason is MLS debut. Uh, You could not have scripted it better for MLS in terms of how it turned out. Uh, He scored the game-winning goal on a free kick in the last seconds of the game. Uh, He came on pretty early in the second half, uh, was magnificent, just a different level, as you'd expect. And this is why he's my who's up. Uh, forgetting Apple, we'll discuss you know the implications with Apple and the story you reported upon in terms of their subscriber numbers. Uh, forgetting MLS, the thing that I think might be lost from people who aren't big soccer fans is the Copa Americas is a huge international tournament which is coming up. Then the World Cup um, is going to be in the United States in 26. So you look at where we are going in terms of what Messi wants and someone. Like, I'm not going to say they're close to Messi, but someone who's familiar with his thinking um, told me that what his goal, one of his goals, and maybe this has been reported elsewhere, he wants to be like Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, the biggest thing ever in the world. And United, the United States is his, like the last market to kind of for him to conquer, which he's already super popular, as we've seen, uh, but even become even bigger. And I just think where it possibly is going, if he stays healthy, if he plays well, uh, and if he goes through and plays with Argentina, trying to defend a World Cup, uh, where this could go for Lionel Messi in terms of what he means globally when you talk about the greatest athletes, the most recognized athletes of all time, um, it started off pretty well on Friday in uh, MLS and where it could go the next few years. So my who's up, Lionel Messi. My who's up, Andrew, you're going to have to forgive me on this one, but I have to do this one as a lifelong Washingtonian. And my who's up is Josh Harris, who is a new majority owner of the Washington Commanders, who are going to be called Commanders for who knows how long. Uh, His honeymoon in D.C. is going to last for a long, long time for the simple reason that he's not Dan Snyder. The amount of goodwill going through the city right now and the entire market is unlike anything I've ever seen. It's hard for him to take a, make a bad step. He bought beers for people celebrating the uh, change in ownership. It was a big party that down by a uh, Nats park. I'm sure that uh, ticket sales are going to go through the roof and I'm sure the sponsors are going to start to come back. And here is the most unique thing. If you listen to this podcast, if you're just watching television, the NFL is the most popular entertainment Uh, not just sports, but entertainment in the country, you couldn't feel that or see that in in D.C. over the past decade, probably. What I find to be most unique about this story is I'm going around and I'm trying to find one person who has one nice thing to say about Dan Snyder. Josh Harris, welcome back to D.C. He's originally from D.C. Good luck. It's going to be a good long honeymoon. Quick question for you. Does he change the name? My guess is that he's going to change the name and he's going to try to change any association with the previous regime. Yeah. And then just this is like a two word answer, one word answer. What will the new name be in your opinion? Here's my hope. This isn't what I think. This is my hope. It's going to go back to the 1980s and it'll be something like the Washington Hogs or it's going to be the the 80s were the glory days of this franchise. Yeah, I think I think Red Hogs. How about that? I like that. Is that such a thing? I just made it up, but (laughs) I go Red Hogs. All right, my who's down is Fox Sports, uh, and this is a humongous pet peeve for me and anyone who watches sports. The U.S. women's game is on Wednesday. Kickoff is scheduled for 9 p.m. Eastern. Fox advertises during their broadcast, coverage starts 
at 7 p.m. No mention after of kickoff is at 9. Come on, Eric Shanks, Brad Zager, Mark Silverman, uh, at all. Uh, come on. You guys got to do me a little bit better than that. If you want to tell me 845 for a 9 o'clock start, okay. But two hours early, people who, like, I cover this for a living. I had to just, it's like, they're saying 7 o'clock. I, I thought the game was at 9, so I went and looked it up before I'm going to criticize them. The game is at 9. They keep saying coverage starts at 7. People might rush home from work only to have to listen to Alexei Lawless. I mean, that's, come on, Fox Sports. We can't have two hours uh, before being told we need to be there uh, and, and watch the coverage starts. Again, 15 minutes, all right, I can forgive you. But two hours, that's my who's down. How many accidents are they causing by those poor people rushing home from work, Andrew? I don't know. It's, it's no good. That's not a good one for them. My who's down, I'm going uh, to Jim Vanderhey. Of, uh, uh, he's a CEO of Axios, and it's uh, predicated on one of my favorite publications, uh, Axios Sports and Kendall Baker. Uh, Kendall uh, just announced to his subscribers on Monday that he was leaving the Axios family. And that, uh, his newsletter, Axios Sports, presumably is going to stick with Axios, but that is a Kendall Baker production. We don't know where he's going yet, uh, but but he's going to launch an, an, another newsletter that I'm sure is going to look and feel like Axios Sports. Kendall's from uh, DC, an Oriole fan, Andrew. I know the amount of time and effort he puts into that publication. I wonder if he even sleeps uh, sometimes. I think that for Axios, they were trying to build out a big sports uh, vertical. Uh, it was it was centered around uh, Kendall. Uh, with Kendall leaving, it's uh, it's hard to see what they're going to be doing in sports. But a big shout out to Kendall Baker, one of a uh, uh, editor writer of one of my uh, favorite publications that's out there. Yeah, and you kind of buried the lead when you said he's an Oriole fan. He has done a great job with that uh, with the with the newsletter, and he does mention Adley Rushman sometimes. So I guess that's uh, definitely gives you gets you credit here on this pod, at least uh, from the John Oran <laughs> side of things. <laughs> with that, let's move to the topics before we get to Mike Tirico. Last week uh, we had Jessica Reef Ehrlich on, and uh, she was excellent. And a lot of her comments got picked up in a lot of different places. Uh, and we talked about Bob Iger's, um, what he said on CNBC uh, and ESPN strategic partner. Uh, and she thought what he said really spelled out for uh, Comcast. You know, since then, we've heard from a lot of people, John, just your like, let's just look back at, at you know, what, what's your impression a week later in terms of uh, where things are going with ESPN and strategic partners. Also, there is uh, Alex Sherman over at CNBC uh, broke a story last week uh, that uh, they've had initial talks with the NBA about taking a strategic position in, in ESPN. Uh, the NFL as well. Uh, the NFL has been looking for somebody to take a strategic position in the NFL for a while. And so they've they've been talking uh, uh, MLB apparently as, as, as well. I think the, the, the my main takeaway from this is that when uh, Bob Iger said he was open for looking for a strategic partner, we're seeing firsthand uh, all the different uh, potential partners that are out there. There's traditional media companies like uh, like Comcast that uh, Jessica was 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 big on. There's the leagues that potentially want to come in and they want to make sure that that. ESPN is as strong and healthy as it can be. And it also wants to start to profit on a, a little more than they have on, on the uh, media landscape that's developing. Uh, I did the story a couple of weeks ago about um, venture capitalists that, that are really taking a look at it. And, and I think that that could also be a strategic move depending on who the venture capitalists come in with as far as a management team for, uh, for ESPN. There's the gambling outfits uh, th th that are out there. Um, there, are, there are a lot of people that are interested in taking the strategic position. And so the question then goes back to Iger, what does he want this for? Uh, and he said he wanted it for distribution. He wanted it for financing and uh, you know possibly some programming as well. How does he rank each of those? I would think that he wants uh, a strategic vision with a lot of money uh, behind it that eventually he can come back in and sort of buy out. So I'm, I'm still, and I'm hearing from people that, that are still on the venture capital uh, train, but he's open and talking to, to a lot of different people. And it's not just Iger too. I, I mean, Jimmy Pitaro is a part, part of all these talks. 
you know, the Comcast aspect of it, I'm not sure if I see it necessarily. Like, I, yes, it does have distribution, but it feels like it has more of the old distribution. Uh, it has broadband, which could be helpful uh, in terms of business. But the events it has, I mean, ESPN has probably the best portfolio of anyone. I mean, Fox Sports probably could give it a little bit of a run for its money in terms of major events, but uh, not tonnage. Uh, so you have to probably give ESPN the advantage. Uh, and then, you know, NBC has great events. You know, we have Tariq Wan and, you know, Olympics, Super Bowls, et cetera, Sunday Night Football, Big Ten now. But like, does ESPN need more events? And I, and I guess you could say, well, you could add Peacock into the fold that's 21 million subscribers maybe there's something to do there but i don't know if i see that necessarily i mean the big ones that probably make the most sense um which can i interrupt you for a quick second andrew i i understand why comcast would want it the idea that um the only people left and and as part of the cable bundle are sports fans and 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 people that, that want live events so if they can control or get some sort of ownership stake in, in the biggest sports uh, c- company out there in ESPN, I and mean, it would make sense for Comcast. But is that part of? I think what you're asking is that, that part of the strategic vision that Iger was talking about. Yeah, exactly. So there's that. And then in terms of the leagues, yeah, you made some good points in terms of uh, they want ESPN to be strong, but I think they want ESPN to be strong so they can pay them billions of dollars. And I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think they're going to have to be very creative to make it work. You know, the ESPN, you know, the idea of them being involved with the NFL network, I mean, that dates back forever. I mean, there's rumors and talks have been going on uh, since you started writing about this stuff in, uh, you know, 1971. Uh, And so, (laughs) and so it it didn't start till 79. Uh, Anyway, but those have been going on for a long time. So I don't know if I see it with the NFL. Like, I mean, I think they wanted someone involved when they were selling the latest Sunday ticket package and it didn't, it didn't work out for whatever reason uh, in the end. Uh, but I don't know if I see it fully. That's a tough sell for the NFL. I mean, that's one of the reasons that they, they launched that, that streaming service uh, yeah, last course. year. Right now, what the NFL has is that it has NFL network and, you know, some digital and websites or whatever. It's, it's old media. Uh, so that, that, that's a tough sell. And the other, the other part of ESPN too is look, we're going through, Court cutting right now is like it's not stopping anytime soon. And so the prospects of ESPN losing affiliate revenue coming from cable, I mean, it's going to be a rough couple of years over at at, uh, at ESPN. Is that something that the NBA wants to invest in now? Bob Iger believes it's going to turn around. Jimmy Pitar believes it's going to turn around. And a lot of analysts believe it's going to turn around, but there's going to be a hiccup in traditional media and, and yeah. that, that we're that we're already seeing. If you're a league, is that when you want to do it as a, as it's starting to go downwards, or do you want to get it after it goes down and starts to come up? It's a that that's a tricky question there. Well, I do think when you look at the MLS deal with Apple, which is all in, um, and Apple seems to want to be all in with uh, these leagues. Uh, you know, is there a hybrid of that? You know, Apple, Eddie Q said again, kind of stated that when he looks at sports, he wants their global company and they want rights that are global. But, you know, if they're like all or nothing, you know, maybe there's a way where you're not all or nothing, where there's a relationship. And I think Disney's goal in the sports space is also to be global. I mean, that's where the, that's where like the money is in terms of growth. Uh, if you can be that when you're selling subscri- to subscribers, uh, you can reach the whole world. And that's really where you really can make your hay uh, is you're just selling in every country. And that's what we'll see, you know, how successful Messi and MLS, which we're going to talk about in a minute or two, uh, how successful they'll be. That's where maybe there's something, if you can get creative, where it's not all in and it kind of makes sense. Maybe there's some partnerships there, but on the face of it, I don't necessarily see it fully. I think it's kind of a little too complicated and doesn't necessarily work uh, for the leagues, especially you know, at this point, I don't see what, what they're necessarily getting out of it because in theory, they could just sell the games directly themselves. Like they could cut out the middleman. Who do you see as the most likely uh, buyer of a strategic position in ESPN right now? Not necessarily company, but sector. Uh, Digital. I think Amazon, Apple, that type of relationship to me makes the most sense. I mean, that's always the one. Um, and maybe, I, I, you know, from Apple's point of view, again, they like to own everything. So I don't know if they'll be interested in it. Um, you know, Amazon and Disney, that's kind of a strange relationship, perhaps. But I just think that 
that's where it's distribution. I mean, Fanatics, it's kind of, you know, they haven't gotten in the media, but they do have distribution digitally. Um, you know, that's what seemingly Michael Rubin's plan is in the gambling space is that they already have, you know, a hundred million or so uh, email addresses. So they can just go right direct to their consumers. And, um, you know, how many of those can you turn into sports gamblers? Uh, and so like that theory could maybe work um, with ESPN as well. You know, that, that th- those are valuable things. Now does ESPN and Disney already have those type of relationships? I'm not positive about that. Uh, but to me, that makes some sense. Uh, in terms of a partnership, especially as they get into, you know, ESPN, I get it. We all want to say it's the end of ESPN. They're going to get into the gambling space at some point. Like they haven't done that yet. You know, they've been a little slow with that, but I think that's going to happen at some point. Um, and that can be pretty lucrative. And I've been told this a couple of times that when the November earnings come out, you know, despite layoffs that people are going to say that they're, they're going to be very impressed. People are going to be like, wait, why are there layoffs? Um, so I don't know. Uh, you know, I think the rumors of their demise might be a little premature, in my opinion. Well, if you're going to parse Iger's words, which is what we have to do, right, uh, from uh, from that interview, which is now a couple of weeks ago, he is a big believer in sports and on uh, on digital and streaming. He talked about selling ABC, the broadcast network. He talked about selling all of the entertainment assets that he had just bought a couple of years ago from Fox. Uh uh, and but the but he was not talking about selling ESPN and was not talking about getting out of sports. So I find it hard to believe that uh, in searching for a strategic partner that he would just sell ESPN and walk away from it. I think that he sees a value of sports programming in the digital future uh, that that we're all headed for. Let's move into topic two: MLS and Messi. Uh, as I said um, in my who's up, what a debut for Messi. Uh, I was camping in Bar Harbor under a tent on my phone, I barely had service, uh, and I uh, was watching Messi. It was a choice between Messi and the Women's World Cup. I knew the U.S. opening game was going to be a blowout, so I wasn't as interested. Didn't have the option of two screens at that point. That was a home run for Messi. You had a big story this week along with your colleague Alex Silverman in terms of the amount of subscribers that, uh, according to your sources, Apple and MLS say that they have. Uh, which is approaching a million when you consider they're giving away 400,000 or so um, with season ticket holders. And then there's also the T-Mobile giveaways. I'm not sure if that's, it's an okay number. I'm not sure it's a great number. And obviously, and I've been a big proponent, Messi is a game changer in terms of selling subscriptions worldwide. Um, but I do think there is questions about, do they, does the, do these MLS teams have any information about their fans now? Does Apple have all that proprietary information? How does it help you sell advertising locally and some of the other parts of your business? Um, but like, I don't know all that. So, but but in terms of subscription, that's I thought that was a okay number. You used the word approaching a million. I'd like to know how much work that word approaching is doing. Um, <laughs> are we approaching at nine hundred ninety-seven thousand? Are we approaching at eight hundred fifty thousand? Uh, that's a big word approaching. But number one is whatever Messi ends up making between getting some cut of the subs with uh, Apple and Adidas, it's a win for for MLS. It's there's no way to look at it. Don't like the thing about Messi, and I've told you this. First off, it's different to watch him play. He's just different on the field. It's like watching Michael Jordan in his prime. And you could argue, you know, people want to say retirement league. Messi is still Messi. They, he just won the World Cup as the best player on his team. So, and uh, it's just the quality that he comes. It's just, it's like amazing to watch. Like it's just different to watch him. And MLS, like I get on a little bit, but the quality is pretty good. People love to just like, you know, put their nose up at it, but they, they the players are better than, then like they're they're good they're they're good players. The quality isn't Premier League or other leagues, but they it's not like he's playing. It's like a man against kids. These are pro, pros. I mean, Andrew, take a breath. He, he just made a free kick. I've seen Ben Olsen make free kicks. Like, well, come on, like that that didn't seem that unusual to me. It was in like the last. Se- I mean, look, it felt like honestly. Papa Clicker always says it's fake. You know, this is uh, fake. You know, it's fixed. Um, <laughs> it felt fixed. I mean, got going honestly, it felt fixed, but it like worked out like too perfectly. Uh, but that's what he does. That's what the greats 
do. Again, I know, like, I didn't read it, but there's some um, Taylor Twelman who does Apple's games. He tweeted at the guy. I don't know. Somebody from New Yorker, I think, poo pooed it, said it was kind of sad or something. I didn't read it, but hey, whatever. You don't like fun? Do you hate happiness? This is what it's supposed to be, okay? Like, and I wrote about this in my newsletter. Now, the MLS, the bigger picture is, and we've discussed this. Now, they, gotta, they have to build on this. It can't just be like, all right, the messy show, like it's Ted Lasso and just shows up every once in a while. You got to make me care about NYCFC and want to watch their games too. Care about, get people into Red Bull Arena in New Jersey. I mean, that, that's the issue that they really have to have. Now, it's a, it, there's a lot of places where they draw really well, and it's 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 going, but they just, they didn't be in that competitive league. I don't know. You can't argue against what happened on Friday night, in my opinion. Now, do people watch it? A friend of mine, last thing, a friend of mine texted me, how do I watch this game? I have Apple TV plus. I said, yeah, you need a subscription. Even though maybe that first game was free. I told him, I said, maybe this first, cause I have the sub, but maybe it's free. And he found it um, and watched the Spanish language broadcast, uh, which did tremendous, you know, 1.35 million or something. Um, so, uh, I don't know. Does it sell subs? Probably, but how many is the question? My experience on that Friday night, the Orioles game ended early and I went to watch uh, the U.S. women nat- uh, national team uh, game. And as soon as uh, Messi scored the goal, I went on to Twitter. I guess we have to call Twitter X now. I went on to <laughs> X and uh, and th- I-, I saw about like 50 different uh, uh, versions and views of, of-, of that goal, which uh, I-, I don't know if that was uh, unique or not. I thought that approaching a million, I bet it's over a million now. It was, uh, it was, uh, you know, certainly in the 900 uh, thousands. And uh, that was before Messi even played a game uh, that, that, that number came from. Uh, I think the number is really okay. I don't think it, it, it didn't make my jaw drop. I don't think that, you know, people are going to go running around the streets, you know, uh, cheering it. But one thing, you know, the MLS All-Star Game, it was just here in D.C., so I, I saw a lot of owners. I saw a lot of MLS executives. Uh, uh, a- Apple was all over uh, the, the town. They complained consistently that we're so focused on the numbers right now of what's a 10-year deal uh, that, that that Apple has with MLS. And so if, if you Welcome believe, to the major leagues. That's what I would have told them. It, it, well, you know, it partly is welcome to the major leagues, and I'm going to steal that line, but Apple is viewing this much differently than TV networks are. So TV networks, it, it is about, let's get it in a window. Let's build up an audience. And Apple is like, we're, you know, they're, they're trying to build out a, you know, a different platform. So they, they one of their complaints is that stop using TV terms to, to uh, talk about, you know, what we'll, terms should we use? Cause I texted Bernadette last week as their PR person. I didn't hear back from, I don't think they like me, but anyways, the, uh, I like you. But, Thanks, John. Wait, what what terms should we use? I don't think it's necessarily terms. It's just like they're they're building something. So, so it's a, it, 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 this is a, this is all a process that, that you know once the World Cup gets here in 2026, they expect that they're going to be ma- making a bundle of money off this deal, and that there's going to be a lot more subscribers in it, and it's, and it's going to build to that. But it's not going to. So the way it works. So if they're listening, the way it works though is then when that happens, we're doing a podcast. We'll see how great it is. But we we have to talk about what's happening right now. Like, yeah, that I think that's a good theory that might come to fruition. But you also could argue that in 2026, Messi might retire after the World Cup, and then there's no and Messi. Then what happens? And, and then, then like and they that- lose all the subscriptions, or a lot of them around the world. Now maybe they bring in somebody else, or bring in, or the what I'm talking about. What they really need to do is make sure the level is high enough. Um, but you only can grade it right now. And do I think there's some intelligence and the very logical way to look at what they're doing. Yeah, I do. Um, I think it's smart. And I think Messi, like I said, is a tremendous uh, move. And, you know, they say that they're, you know, according to your sources, they're approaching a million when you're giving away almost half of those numbers. I don't know if that's so great. It's it's okay. And you're right. It is a 10 year deal, but you know, in 10 years, if we're still doing this podcast and it's the, you know, Apple's owns everything, we'll say, yeah, that was a brilliant move. Um, but there has to be evidence of that. There isn't evidence yet. Well, here's the other thing to take a look at. And one thing that I heard uh, consistently from some owners is, you know, where is this growth coming from? If, if uh, they're going to all of a sudden get, uh, you know, millions of, of subscribers in Argentina, like that helps Apple and it helps the national sponsors like Adidas, 
but how does it help a, a local club that's trying to sell local sponsorships and, and stadium signage and, you know, and trying to do what, you know, traditional uh, sports teams do in every other league. And so they, they, they all, you know, what, what I heard, heard is, you know, growth is great, but let, let, let's, let's build it domestically. And so that's something to keep an eye on. So I, I know Apple loves the global and I know the, the, the top line headline is all about global, but there still is some grassroots that needs to be taken care of. John, before we go to the next, we, we finish up before we get to Chirico and go talk about the Pac-12 in a second, um, which also has to do maybe with Apple uh, or maybe not. Uh, Eddie Q said that he only wants stuff that's globally, they can sell globally. They don't want one phone. You can watch something in another phone. You can't have it. Uh, he said there could be exceptions. What's your view about that? And especially in relation to the NBA. Well, what uh, Eddie Q did not answer is what if Apple had Thursday night basketball, but the global rights to it. Mm -hmm. So like if you have one exclusive sort of stream of the game, would that be, would that be something that he wants or, or is, is it the MLS type of deal or or bust where it's like they, they, they just want everything having to do with it. I find it hard to believe that Adam Silver in the NBA Will sell would sell everything to one company, even though the, a company with deep, deep pockets like Apple could. Yeah, sell I'd say like zero important. chance. But yeah, I think that's that that's highly unlikely. So would Apple get in and say like, all right, yeah, give us a package because what they're doing with um with Major League Baseball on Friday nights, which is exclusive to to Apple, it, that feels like a test to me, right? It doesn't feel like part of their sort of sports strategy. It feels like they they want to make sure that they get the, you know, uh, the, the live productions, uh, down pat. Yeah, I, I could see that. And I just think that it does put into question though, where Apple and the NBA end up. I, I think, I mean, I know that Apple really wants the NBA. I just don't know. There's just no path. Even if I think, I don't even think contractually they could give them everything. I mean, I, I'm not, it's not going to happen because you're just not going to, you want the reach of ABC and ESPN and all the other stuff. And you don't want one partner no matter basically no matter how much they offered you, right? Like, I just don't know if there's an offer that you could make because you're just, you got to think about the next deal. Uh, you can't just think about this deal. So uh, I thought those comments were curious, which brings us to a long running curious comments. Uh, and that has to do with the PAC 12 and they had their media day last week. Uh, George Kliakoff, their commissioner uh, reading off a teleprompter um, did not really shed much light on their media deal, except to say that they're going to have one, which I tend to agree they will have one at some point. The question is, with with who and when? My source is now, most places are either out or they would do a deal that's very advantageous to them. That's what I'm getting. Now, that said, we, we always say this, I think we know a lot. We talk to a lot of people. We don't know everything. So maybe there's somebody out there. I do think they'll get a deal um, will be good enough to keep the conference together. I'm not positive about that, but like, this is what I would say. And there's just so much chatter on the internet whenever you comment on the big 12, but I will say this, if things are going in the wrong direction in terms of how they're going to go, this is how it goes. Like the way that this story is unfolding, this is how it ends in a, not a great way for the PAC 12, right? Because they put their presidents have put out a lot of deadlines and said, we're going to have a deal and we like a deal. And then, you know, I wrote months ago, watch Colorado. Um, now there's a lot of watch UConn as well as Colorado. You look at it and you wonder where this deal is coming from, because when there's reports saying that there there's other entities involved, like someone had the other day, Fox and like Fox is not really involved and Fox would, you know, I think they would do a very advantageous deal for Fox, uh, which I don't know if that keeps even the conference together, like how that works exactly. Um, so I don't know where, like none of these stories say a network. They just say that there's nothing to worry about. It's going to happen, but they don't tell you where. Um, so my question to you, John Oran, master of sports business media, where are they getting this deal from in your opinion? I mean, if he was reading off the teleprompter, I've covered media deals for a long time. It's sort of my stock and trade. I, I love co- I love co- covering these rights deals. Like you don't want to talk about oh the longer we hold out the better the deal gets. I mean, you're almost taunting the people that you're trying to do deals with. It's mm-hmm. a uh, it, it's a a bizarre strategy 
to tr- to try try to see this over over the finish line. So, will the Pac-12 get a deal? Yes. Will it be a deal that keeps a Pac-12 intact? That's uh, like, I don't know the answer to that. Like, I, I think there's there's a good chance that they're, they're going to see the deal and and uh, uh, and some of the schools are going to see the deal and, and want more. Uh, or there's a chance that the, they're going to see the deal and say like, yeah, this the, the, this is okay. A deal is going to get done. They're going to be announcing something almost certainly uh, by by September. Uh, I, I've I've been told. I, I don't want to make another deadline, but that's that seems like a logical. Uh, deadline to get. But the idea of these university presidents and now the conference commissioner continuously setting deadlines in the sand and then having to sort of backtrack and then knowing that everybody wanted to talk about the media deal during media days and saying, oh, we're doing his best Bill Belichick saying like, oh, we want to, uh, we're only going to concentrate on football, you know, today was, um, was disappointing. Yeah. On to Cincinnati. Um, is the other thing. and the other thing is my final point would be like, when you have the, what's the old saying, when you have the facts, you bang the facts when, I don't know, there's something else with it. And then you bang the table. I feel like they're banging the table. Yeah. Yeah. You know that saying? That's a new one on me, but I'm, uh, I'm going to be using it now. It was like a Chris Mason, Chris Mason special. Find that clip, Chris. <laughs> Just the facts, ma'am. All right, John, let's bring in the big get. It's NBC's Mike Tirico. Mike is the host of the Olympics play-by-play on Sunday Night Football. He's on golf. He's on basically every big event on NBC. And most importantly, my mom, Mama Clicker, Alice Marchand, is a big fan of his work. Well, I'm taken back by that. I'm taken back by that, Andrew. Now, Dad gets a little nod in your column when he reviews books. Does Mom get any column inches at all or no? No, Mom does not. Mom doesn't. She's not as big a sports fan. Now, she had a... Understood. Suffer through, you know, we reminisce sometimes that I was studying when I, I, I had a Cal Ripken Jr. like streak of watching Sports Center from 1979 till about <laughs> 1995, where my streak was broken when I studied in London. But uh, she suffered through that. But she she has grown to have some opinions. She's a big Chris Russo fan as well. That's, those are those are the I'm, two people, Tariko and Russo. I'm in good company. I'm in good company. I love it. Well, <laughs> Well, Mike, the timing of having you on now is perfect. We're a year away from the Summer Olympics in Paris uh, that you're going to be hosting, of course. But I want you to go back to when you were at the Newhouse School at Syracuse University. And if somebody had told you at that point that one day you were going to replace Bob Costas as the host of the Olympics, and you were going to replace Al Michaels as the play-by-play voice of the most watched uh, series in the NFL on Sunday night football. Was that part of your plan? Was that something that you uh, had set as a goal that you wanted to do? Absolutely not. <laughs> not, not for a second. You'd be, you'd be a fool if you thought that you could do those things, John. Um, you know, I'll correct you on one thing. I didn't replace those guys. I followed them because you don't replace Bob. You don't replace Al. Uh, they are Mount Rushmore guys what they did to carve out the niche that they did over the years and the legacy is probably a better word that's untouched. And I've just had the opportunity to follow them. And I really do believe that um, in in my heart, you know, when I was in Syracuse and in school there, I'm the first from my family to graduate college. And I was lucky enough to be the recipient of the Bob Costas scholarship. So I got to meet Bob, Uh, Bob, as the story goes, he came up, and he just wanted to make sure that uh, his first scholarship that he gave back to Syracuse didn't go to some knucklehead. And it turns out that it was another guy who uh, grew up in New York and uh, went to Syracuse and had the opportunity to meet Bob. So I've known Bob since the mid 80s all the way through. I didn't think that he would be leaving his role as the host of the primetime show for the Olympics when he did. I thought it would be a little while longer. So I those things were never even part of my thought process when I was in school, let alone even my days at ESPN. And as I came to NBC, obviously things played out and here you are doing both and uh, so lucky to do it. And I I now see why Bob was so great at this job, because this job is a very unique one. The primetime host of the Olympics, it asks you to do a lot of different things and uh, nobody better than Bob at doing that. So he set a pretty high bar to hopefully try to stay close to for these uh, next few games on my end. So I, I think that you're unique 
in that you followed such legends uh, at, at, at NBC. What was it like for you sort of you, like that, that would have me curled up in a fetal position, maybe, you know, I, I would think. What, what was it like for you to, to like, are, are there still nerves about doing it? Do you yeah. worried about being compared to to those guys? No, I, I don't, uh, because I try to do it in my own way, my own style, uh, what I've learned, what I've observed watching them. But you've got to be yourself. You, you have to be the person who you are uh, over time as you're doing these kind of assignments you know what helped me honestly was early on when i started doing golf at abc in 1997 i followed brett musburger doing that so you already were in the first time i got a network gig calling events i was replacing or following a legend and then after that when we started with monday night at espn you know monday night was still that property sunday night was now changing and becoming the main property in the nfl broadcast windows. And Al was the voice of Monday Night Football for that long run up until the end of the 2005 season when he moved to Sunday night to start 2006. And then I followed with Kornheiser and Theismann. So I had already done it a couple of times in terms of replacing a legend in the business in one of those chairs. So when these couple of events happened, and plus I was much deeper in my career, it wasn't as big a deal in terms of that, oh my gosh, you're replacing so-and-so. Still significant, absolutely, but it doesn't make me nervous now. Not much trepidation going in. I think just the anticipation of uh, being involved in one of the big broadcast properties in both the Olympics and Sunday Night Football. You know, Now you're Mike Tirico, Olympic host, yeah, Sunday Night Football, the whole thing. But when you were coming out of college, even though obviously you're a talent, and you're trying to get that big break. How did you land at ESPN? What was the big break there for you? Yeah, you know, a, a variety of things. First off, I got a job doing the weekend sports at Channel 5 in Syracuse, New York, the CBS station, when I was wrapping up my junior year of college. So I, my whole senior year, I ended up working, doing the Monday, the Monday to Friday reporting three days a week, and then Saturday, Sunday, anchoring and hosting our coaches' shows. I got to host Jim Beheim's. A uh, coaches show for basketball on the t local TV station, the CBS affiliate, not a campus station. And Dick McPherson, the late uh, great coach at Syracuse. So I hosted their shows and worked with the rest of our news team there. And I was there for about four years and had applied to ESPN. At that time, you sent a tape in to the Al Jaffe, who is the legendary guru of talent at ESPN. Uh, and then one of the ESPN executives, John Wildhack, who ironically enough is now the athletic director at Syracuse. John had a lake house and still does up in upstate New York, and he's an alum, and he saw me on TV a couple of times. So all those things kind of fit together in the timing at ESPN. So it was more good timing than necessarily one big break or one moment. But I guess the biggest break to get into the industry at age 20 for me was the fact that we went through a couple of sportscasters at the local TV station that I was interning at in about four or five weeks, and they wanted to hire somebody young and cheap. And at the time, I was both. And that's where it all started. And it's just kind of gone on for now, I don't know, 36 years, I guess. Now, during your time at ESPN, you, you were able to get great assignments, you know, obviously capped by Monday Night Football. How, how, what kind of opportunities did you have to leave before you actually left for NBC? What was the closest you ever came to leaving? Yeah, not, not really very close. Um, really didn't. There was, there was not a lot of conversation. I was in a position where I had re-upped my contracts you know, while there was still time on them uh, as assignments changed. And we get, let's just go back to, gosh, this would be 02. We get the NBA at ESPN and I transitioned to doing that. And from that, you know, your deal is extended because I'm going to be part of the NBA coverage for the first four or five years of that. So and then same thing happened with Monday Night Football. So really never close to going anywhere else until we got through as Monday Night Football was going on, and then NBC was starting to look down the road for what opportunities were they going to have for the next person to be ready for these other jobs. And that's really what got the ball started. I, I could have stayed at ESPN my whole career and been very happy. Um, I loved my time there, loved the people I worked with there, and there was no real desire to go anywhere until those opportunities came up. And so what happened, though? Why didn't ESPN keep you? How did NBC court you? Like, what, what, was the, what transpired there? Yeah, well, without all the all the behind the scenes details, because they're they're boring and nobody really truly truly cares about them. Uh, it was NBC's interest was expressed through my agent Sandy Montag, and then to me eventually. And 
with the opportunity to do things that I had never done before, like the Olympics, like the Triple Crown races, and stay involved with the National Football League on the primetime shows. The NBC at that time had both Thursday and Sunday night football. And I was originally ticketed to do the Thursday night games while Alan Chris did the Sundays. And then there was a whole back and forth with uh, not letting the non-A team do the games on Thursday nights. And eventually I did a bunch of games that first year I got there. But one of the benefits of that was I got the chance to do the Notre Dame package for six years that I never thought I would do. And I absolutely fell in love with that package and doing Notre Dame games, going to South Bend and, and calling one team every home game, but one for about a six year stretch, which was something I never imagined. And at ESPN, you never get the chance to do a game in South Bend because of that NBC contract. So all that together, it just worked out perfect. And I was 25 years at ESPN, 10 years of Monday Night Football. I had just turned 50. It was just a great time to write another chapter. And it was great. The timing was great. And NBC has been more than I would have expected going there. I was hoping it was going to be a great opportunity, new events, new assignments, working with some folks who you respected, being a part of the Olympics. And it's been way above any of that that I thought it would be going in. Uh, this has been such a rewarding and fun already seven years and uh, excited for the next few to come after. Mike, both uh, Andrew and I, we spilt a lot of ink uh, on your move to NBC. The idea of, of stepping in for a Sunday night football, you know, and Al Michaels uh, staying a little bit longer than I know that executives were, were thinking about. Did you get frustrated by that? I probably would have gotten frustrated if we didn't have the Olympics and Notre Dame football and all the other stuff that I'm involved with going on. Like when you, when you take a step back and look at what I was doing at that time, calling the Notre Dame games, hosting football night in America, the top rated show of all the pregame shows, being involved in our triple crown coverage, the Indy 500, as you know, I called golf at ABC and ESPN from 97 until 2016 when I left. So I got to be a part of the players championship, the U S open, the open, the PGA Tour playoffs, all that stuff, plus the Olympic Games, because Bob had stepped aside at that point. And now I was stepping in to do the, my first couple of Olympics as the primetime host. That was plenty. I mean, that, that's a full job as it is. So I was still involved with the NFL, still got to call a few games here and there during the year, in addition to that Notre Dame package. So would I have been frustrated if I had nothing else to do? Yes. But the plate was so full. And all of it was so new that, John, it, it didn't be build in frustration, just patience, wait your turn. And when you get the opportunity, do the best you can. And, you know, last year, I was so thrilled to be a part of that team. You know, Mike, when I think about your career at ESPN, I just recall seeing you on the air almost every single night. You were doing college basketball games. You were doing golf telecasts. You were doing the NFL. You were doing pretty much whatever ESPN asked you to do. Now over at NBC, it seems like you're doing a lot more big events, but I'm not seeing you as often as I did when you were at ESPN. Can you compare the differences in your role between ESPN and NBC? John, what is interesting, at least to me, now that I step back and look at it, I wasn't thinking of it this way. ESPN has all the volume. It's 24-7, 365 on ESPN and two and you and news and ACC, SEC network, radio, the whole, the whole deal, right? We all know the networks and how much they're on. With NBC, a lot of our NBCSN stuff has migrated to either USA Network or to Peacock. So you have that plus what appears on NBC Sports. It, it's not the same volume. So for me, I guess it's uh, less quantity, but the quality has certainly increased. Like look at May with the Derby and Indy 500. Those are the two biggest events in those sports. And getting to work those is different than the volume of stuff at ESPN. So that's why for me, it's been a good time for me to make this pivot. Uh, more time not working has not helped my golf game, but it's been a great part of my life to this point. Now, we're, we're one year away from the Olympics starting. And I think, you know, the, the job of host, you're transitioning a lot. But the amount of study 
that I think must go into it because you need to know about everything, right? You need yeah, to right. how to pronounce even like the pronunciation aspect of it. I'm sure is daunting. What is the year like? How does it go for you? You know, Costas used to talk about it. What is the prep like for you? Because even though a lot of us don't know all these names around the world of each athlete from every event it's still the expectation in your role is to get everything exactly correct. Uh, so what is right. that like for you, you know, from pronunciation to knowing all of the backstories, you know, how, how do you go about being ready uh, for a year from now? Yeah. First things first, it's a team effort. Uh, our research team, this dates all the way back to the Dick Ebersol days and from Dick Ebersol starting the business. So anybody read his book as an Olympic researcher back in the Rune Arledge days. The thread that has been a constant is exceptional individuals in the research department for the Olympics. And uh, we, ha we have a, we have a whole team that just does an unbelievable job. And for us, it's not my responsibility to know who is the third best surfer who will be competing in Tahiti when Tahiti hosts the surfing portion of these Olympics. I need to know the big storylines, but also be ready when things happen to know where the answers are and be familiar with surfing, with breaking, which is break dancing, which is a new sport in the Olympics, uh, to be familiar with the geopolitical stuff involved. And then at the top level, know that Leon Marchand from France, who is a student at Arizona State, is a great swimmer who in his home country may have an unbelievable Olympics. He just set a world record a couple of days ago. So in this year of buildup, you're keeping an eye on the World Swimming Championships, World Track and Field Championships, gymnastics, and knowing the global stories and how the U.S. athletes are going to fit in as that plays out. So that, that's, I think, what the responsibility is. But on the big level, it is connecting the dots. It's taking the events in Paris, geopolitical, uh, within each sport, and connecting to the athletes. Why does it matter for Americans? What's the historical impact or significance of these things? And it's a little bit of everything. And the people who know me will tell you that that's kind of like my, my DNA, to be involved in the research of it, have a little bit of a tidbit on stuff and go from there. And the job is just, it's really cool and so much fun because it's a great team effort that you get to front. A couple of things there that your researchers might not have gotten to. Uh, Leon Marchand, uh, if you ever saw me swim, no relation. Yes. Uh, just so you have that. And then secondly, uh, before his time, out of high school, if there was an Olympic event, John Oran could have been in breakdancing. From what my sources tell me, <laughs> was an excellent breakdancer back in the 80s. So feel free to use either of those. We, we did not have moonwalk, but I prefer how uh, <laughs> Mike Tirico uh, pronounced the French Marchand, right? Is, is it Marchand right. over it, in France? Uh, well, uh, when, it, when Andrew comes over for the games, he'll be referred to as Michel Marchand. So... That is just yes. part of the gig. You got to be ready for it. <laughs> there you go. All right. The the uh, the role of uh, Olympic researcher, uh, Mike, help me out here. But uh, you you uh, name check Dick Ebersol was an Olympic researcher. Uh, I believe Jeff Zucker was an Olympic researcher. Correct. Jim Bell. I mean, uh, people that that really ran the media business uh, were, were Olympic researchers. All, all the way through, and our current. So who's are, next? Who yeah, who's well, next? Our our current executive Molly Solomon, who runs our Olympic programming in terms of the production side as the executive producer for Olympic coverage and the lead of the golf channels coverage as well. Molly is our leader and has, you know, stepped in here and done an unbelievable job the last couple of Olympics leading our way through a changing media environment and two really challenging games. I, you know, the, the Emmy awards are always fun and interesting and, you know, you can, you can talk about them all you want. I was just so proud of our team being honored with an Emmy for our Olympics coverage because the experience in Beijing was as difficult a production experience as we've ever seen. A country lockdown, COVID, some people in the U.S., some people in China, uh, people really sacrificed months to be on the ground in China to help bring the games back. Uh, and how it worked from a technical standpoint, from an editorial standpoint, all of that was not without the leadership of Molly and Gary Zinkel, the two of them running our Olympic uh, unit. And uh, it goes back to the people who work at NBC on the Olympics. This is 365 days for them. Every day is dedicated to these two and a half week blocks that come up 
in the summer of 24 next, and then the winter of 26. And after the last three in Asia and the last two with COVID, it's going to be great to have fans in the stands again and to show off a city like Paris for the Olympics. I really think the Olympic movement has a chance to get re-energized by this run of Paris, Milan Cortina for the Winter Olympics in 26, and then the Olympics back in the U.S. We're five years away from L.A. in 28. So uh, this group, I think, has really had us prepared for hopefully what will be some really great competition over the next uh, few Olympic Games, especially a year from now here in Paris. Andrew, I, I have one final question I wanted to ask. And Mike, you referenced the geopolitical aspect of, of, of the Olympics. And you're, of course, uh, as, you, as we've said before, you're following uh, Costas, who really leaned into uh, ge- geopolit- geopolitics uh, to the point. I was worried that he might not come back from Sochi at a, at a, <laughs> a couple of points. How, how, do you, um, how do you compare the way that you approach geopolitic- uh, geopolitics to Costas? Yeah. Um, if it rises to the level that it impacts your understanding of the games, then we talk about it. You have to talk about it. And you know, I'm a political science major in addition to broadcast journalism at Syracuse, and I'm a news junkie and a politics junkie. You can you know, ask our friends at NBC who work in D.C. I want to talk politics with them all the time. I'm fascinated by the political system, not just in our country, but around the world. And, uh, you know, like uh it question question time in parliament uh in in the uk is fun to watch on c-span and i'll watch that before i'll watch first take you know because i kind of know what the guys are debating over there right but i don't know what's going on around the world and like to find out so i'm very interested in it i'm connected to it and there were things that had to be said when we were in china and we said them right out of the gate our first segment of our first broadcast from Beijing while we were on the ground there was all about the Uyghur population. Well, not all about, but we addressed it right on the Uyghur population, the Muslim issue and the treatment of the Uyghurs um, in, in China. And we just decided to just be direct about it. But you don't want to bring it up again on Sunday right after the figure skating fight, right? Unless it's important, unless it matters. We brought up the issue with Russia and the consistent doping issues when there was a doping scandal involving the Russian skaters. Uh, And we brought up the fact that for the last three games, and again, these games, they're appearing not as Russia. Their flag's not flying. They're appearing as athletes from Russia because their Olympic committee has been banned for systemic doping uh, over time here. And now it's the war. You got to talk about that stuff. And we try to take it straight on. And I think, well, I know I was really proud of what our team did and what we delivered from on the ground in China. I wouldn't be honest. I, I, I've been being, being honest. I have to say that I was concerned about if my COVID test was going to come back surprisingly positive all of a sudden after our first night in China. And we made our comments about the treatment of the weakers over there. But I, I, I think the thing that I'll take away the most was I talked to Bob uh, after we got done and Bob had just great compliments for our entire team about how we address things directly right out of the gate. And that meant a lot to me because I I know Bob took that personally. Bob carried the flag for the journalistic part of this job. And are we journalists all the time? Not really, but we do have to be at key moments and we have to know when, like if, you know, when you're, and why do I say that? A a journalist who's writing for a, a newspaper is not going to be reading a promo for the league's um, you know, fantasy game online, like we do during NFL games, right? That's There's no journalistic connection to those two things, right? So you can't sit there and go, I'm a journalist, damn it, because when you do that, you're not. It's just part of the job. However, your journalistic ethics have to show up during a broadcast, while you're call- calling a game, and certainly in situations where politics are part of sports. And as much as we love the Olympics, politics will always be a part of the Olympic Games. You can't get 200 nations together and not have some political wires cross. So we address it, you understand it, you put it in context, and you let people enjoy the competition. But if you pay no attention to it, and you pay no attention to the history of what's going on in the country where you are calling a sporting event, that's a problem. Then you're not really telling the audience the full story. Uh, Some may want just the games. Some may, may want more on the politics. You just got to find the balance. Hopefully we do. We put a lot of thought and effort into 
what's the right context, what's the right amount of content, and then we try to execute it as honestly and directly as we can and get you back to the sports because that's why you tuned in. Last one for me. Would you ever want to get into politics on TV? God, oh, no, 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 no. I, I enjoy watching. I enjoy watching the news. I enjoy watching Lester Holt. Uh, I'll bounce around and watch all the news networks. I like to see how one story is reported three different ways across the cable dial. Um, you know, we, we've kind of lost we've lost our way to deliver facts that people can count on and rely on. Um, we've become a society of opinion. And that's true in sports, too. Like we, we deliver more opinion than we do fact when you watch shoulder programming to sports. It, it's what people want. They want the conversation. Uh, th- there's a place for facts, hopefully, and telling the story straight and letting intelligent viewers decide. And hopefully, as we go through the ebbs and flows of our business, that works out and you can trust the people who you're watching. And to me, that's at the end of the day, the most important, but, but Lester's got that news desk locked down and <laughs> the Today Show folks crush it. I, I like our little world here in sports. It's a lot of fun and uh, it, it's a fun hobby to have to sit back and watch how things play out around our world. Well, great, Mike. It's been a pleasure uh, talking to you. You got a lot of research to do over the next year. You also have about a million events with Sunday night football and golf uh, and Whatever else. Is there anything you, is there anything that you want to do that you haven't done? Is there any event that's out there that's still like kind of uh, the white whale? I know you want to do a Super Bowl, which is on the agenda, but is there any yeah, white whale that's, that's the out one. there? No, nah, that, that, that's the one. You know, I think any of us who call the NFL hope to call a Super Bowl one day. And uh, having the chance to host the pregame of the Super Bowl la- uh, two years ago now, a year and a half ago, was so cool. Uh, it was a great opportunity to be the lead host doing that. So the chance to then – come back the next time we have the Super Bowl and call it. If that happens, that would be wonderful. If not, this has been an unbelievable run to this point. I've enjoyed more good seats than I ever thought I'd have uh, in the business. We get to start our football season in a week. First preseason football game is uh, is next week in Canton at the Hall of Fame game. So Collinsworth is sending us videos already. We're, <laughs> we're studying up on the 90 guys on the Browns and the Jets. So uh, we're ready for that. But no, I've, I've kind of been able to do many more things than I ever imagined. A New York kid who got to call basketball and a hockey game at Madison Square Garden, um, you know, do all these events, work in a bunch of different continents. And you know, I, I, am I the first, am I the first big get guest who's appeared internationally? Actually, no, John. <sighs> With Andres Cantor. Uh, yeah, Andres Cantor, who's a, I, a, a fellow NBCer. Yeah, uh, he's from Qatar. Uh, I, I thought so this was my second. I thought this was my moment of uh, landmark television <laughs> broadcast podcast history. But yeah, uh, no, you're second. I will say we will say. Well, people hopefully listening can't tell we've had a little trouble with the connection coming all the way from Paris. But but the Qatar connection that was more of a struggle. So this was uh, the international uh, connection a little bit better in Paris than Qatar. That was a that was a little bit of a struggle that one. Yeah, I believe <laughs> we can officially say this is the first vid- international video that we've had on the uh, on the podcast. Well, yeah. the, the, you know, it, 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 as long as you do enough research, like the Elias Sports Bureau, if you keep researching, you'll find the uniqueness of each stat. So now that you found it, John, that's good. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to talk to you. And uh, since you are in Paris now, au revoir. Au revoir. Go Orioles for you, John. There you go. Thanks, guys. Good to be with you. Oh, I love it. (laughs) Uh, Final question, Mike. What do you think of Adley Rushman? Oh, gosh, please. Please. Is this like the ninth time he's been mentioned in this podcast already? I'm sure usually with you you it is. Since I don't cover Major League Baseball, I'm a Detroit Tigers fan. So watching where we live, my, my family lives in Michigan. So watching the Orioles turn it around has given me hope that in a couple of years, We'll be talking about Riley Green, Spencer Torkelson, and the Tigers' big turnaround. Much like you have worn us out, John. Anytime we hear about hear from you uh, about the, right about the review, birds, Mike. Oh, right <laughs> there review, you go. Last Bradley Rushman. Four four, star, four <laughs> stars. Great pod. Less birds. Thanks, guys. Take care. <laughs> Thank you. Great to have Mike Tirico on. I mean, just a uh, uh, well on his way to being a Costas, Jim McKay, like type figure in sports media. I mean, a fabulous career that's uh, that, that's only growing. Uh, if I have one takeaway from that, from that, it's his relentless positivity. Like he 
he was positive at ESPN doing a game a night, you know, and traveling to the, these teeny college towns to do college basketball. He was positive when he went over to NBC and, and, and had what, what had to be a frustrating situation, Andrew, when he wanted to do Sunday night football or Thursday night football, and, the, and neither of those were uh, available to him. Uh, it's been hard to replace somebody like Costas on, on the Olympics, but he's just kept a, a mindset, a positive mindset that I think is really kind of cool. I, I like that. You know, he's going to use the fact that you were going to, you were once a great break dancer. Um, <laughs> did you ever break dance, by the way? Oh, man, moonwalk, of course. Come on. <laughs> yeah, well, I, the answer I thought was really good was about the um, journalist, and sometimes they're not journalists, um, which I thought that was the, I, that was articulated the best I've ever heard it. You know, a lot of play by play broadcast sports, they kind of BS you and I'll say whatever I want. It's like, no, you won't. You know, it's like, that's not how it works. And I thought that his answer was good. You know, there are always going to be people who criticize and be like, uh, well, he won't say anything. He's too popular. I don't know. I, I don't know. If, I think you do have to address these things, and but when it's appropriate to address. Um, and it, it and look, NBC doesn't pick where the Olympics are, right? The Olympic Committee does. And like the World Cup, it's kind of, they always seem a little shady with some of the places they end up with, but that's not NBC's doing. I mean, they yeah, they, they could not do the Olympics, but they, they're very successful and they pay a lot of money to do them. So I thought his answer was a very good answer. You know, this shows his skill level on, as a broadcaster because he kind of, I thought finally threaded the needle in terms of what you have to try to do when you do put on some journalistic skills, but then also sometimes you're reading a gambling ad, um, which is not what a journalist would do or, you know, someone who's reporting the facts. Um, and there's different hats. It's performance as well when you're uh, on the air. And so, uh, I thought that was I, I was impressed by that answer uh, among many of his of his answers. So that that was that was fun. Well, Andrew, we're at the end of yet another pod. Uh, th- thank you everybody for listening. Our weekly shout outs to the master of the board, Chris Mason, uh, AC Wyatt, who uh, is back from Ojai, California. I don't think we have audio of AC, but uh, I, he's back in Charlotte now. Um, always good to see you. Uh, please, if you can. Five star ratings are the best. Comments are are, are, are great as well. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you. You guys are high in TV. You're trying to look at the camera and it's dangerous. We've yeah, given you guys yeah, a dangerous yeah, platform. Nobody ever told me how hard it was to talk. <laughs> I, it's very. It's much easier to write. Yeah. You know, every once in a while, if my walk still has a little more time, and I'm listening to you guys. I'll stay for the uh, the outtakes. By the way, you will notice, Mike, that there were no outtakes when we had uh, Colin Cowherd or Paul Feinbaum on a professional you know, on-air, <laughs> folks. Wow.